Okay, we're ready. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Jamie Galoon. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the co-founder and director of HowlRound Theatre Commons. Um, I'm also the interim senior director of Office of the Arts here at Emerson College. Um, I am a white woman with short brown hair, glasses, and today, pink lipstick. And on behalf of HowlRound, I'm really pleased to welcome you here for today's conversation, Public Art for Public Good, Reimagining Community Investment. I also want to say hello to everyone tuning in on HowlRound TV. Thank you, Gracie, for manning the camera. Um, and thank Pro Bono ASL for providing ASL interpretation, uh, specifically Selena Flowers and Lavender de Julia. And also thanks to the National Captioning Institute for providing uh, human-created live captions for this event, which I want to note for folks in the room, you can access through scanning this QR code. Um, and before I go further, I'd love to offer a land acknowledgement. At HowlRound Theatre Commons, we hold ourselves accountable to the work of undoing oppression and advancing equity to overcome our city's bitter history of segregation and racial inequality. As part of this work, we must start by acknowledging that we are residing on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and Massachusetts people whose name was appropriated by this commonwealth. We pay respect to the Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and Massachusetts elders past, present, and future, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we make and present our art. We acknowledge the truth of violence perpetrated in the name of this country and make a commitment to uncovering that truth through dialogue, partnerships, and learning. And this morning, I'd like to uplift in particular the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project, uh, which I first learned about through Siobhan Brown. Uh, the project's mission is to return language fluency to Wampanoag Nation as a principal means of cultural expression. Thank you. So, uh, you're joining us this morning as part of a multi-day convening um, of a new national cohort of theaters uh, composed of Company One Theater here in Boston, Cleveland Public Theater, uh, Crowded Fire Theater in San Francisco, Mosaic Theater Company in DC, and Perseverance Theater in Juneau and Anchorage, Alaska. Um, and we're on our last day of this like magical journey together and we're so excited to be here with you all to ask some critical questions that this group has been um, pondering over the last number of days. Um, it's important to say that this group launched a new collaboration called the Future of American Theater Cohort, um, which was bolstered by support from the Mellon Foundation. Um, this event this morning is produced by Asad HowlRound in collaboration with Company One. And I want to say just a little bit about HowlRound for anyone who may not be familiar. Um, HowlRound is a free and open platform for theater makers around the world to connect. We amplify progressive and disruptive ideas about theater. Uh, we envision a theater field where resources and power are shared equitably in all directions, contributing to a more just and sustainable world. Um, we do all of this based here in the Office of the Arts at Emerson College, along Arts Emerson, um, who is our sister organization um, and Boston's leading presenter of contemporary world theater. Want to shout out my co-leader, Ronnie Panoy, who's in the front row. And um, last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge that this event would not be possible without the generous support of the Mellon Foundation. Lift up that Stephanie is here with us. And also the Barr Foundation. I want to lift up Giles, Sue Ellen, um, Sansan may be watching online. Hi, Sansan. Um, <laughs> and say thank you. Um, and at this time, I'm excited to turn it over to our moderator for today's discussion, Alana Brownstein. Alana is a protosorial dramaturg focused on new work, civic engagement, and anti-oppressive practices. Alana is also the recent past director of new work at Company One Theater, a position she held for 15 years. Alana was also part of the leadership team at C1, and something that's near and dear to my heart, she was a founding member of HowlRound's National Advisory Council. Alana, over to you. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see you this morning. Um, thanks for being here in person and online and up here uh, in the talkie seats. Um, 
Again, my name is Ilana. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am your facilitator today. And uh, I am a white woman with dark blonde hair with a little shocky pink in front uh, and uh, some matching shoes. Um, I'm going to ask, as I, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to turn over to our panelists for them to also provide visual descriptions. But uh, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about what we're here to do today. Um, this conversation is uh, an amazing step in like a many year process. Um, uh, I've had the privilege of being part of uh, a lot of the, almost all of the early conversations around um, how to think about public art and public good in uh, the container of a theatrical producing organization, what that means. Um, and so that's sort of where I sit in terms of uh, how I will be facilitating and um, leading our conversation today. Uh, the goals for this conversation um, are several. Uh, one is we would like to surface and point towards some of the models that are currently underway in Boston that have to do with um, performance and public art and how it's resourced. So by its very nature, this conversation is not comprehensive, right? There's gonna be lots of other things that are happening around the city that we don't get to talk about today. So today it has to do with where Company One's model intersects with the city of Boston, uh, through the mayor's office and the library, and whatever else might come up as we're talking. Um, the framework for the conversation is that we'll start with this panel that you see in front of you. Um, and then uh, at 11 o'clock, we're going to take a short break. We're going to reset the room. And I'm going to provide some housekeeping uh, details for that when we get there. Um, and then after that break, we're going to reconvene in an inner circle, outer circle model, which you don't need to know anything about right now. We'll get there. Um, one of the things I'm really thinking about as we begin this chat and the rest of um, the conversations that will happen today is how do we engage with public art making in Boston and why is the investment in these models of public art as public good necessary? Not just beneficial, but necessary. Um, I am going to introduce our panelists, uh, and they're going to, again, give their own pronouns and visual descriptions once we start. Um, I'm going to start on this end. I have Sean LeCount, artistic director and co-founder of Company One Theater, Summer L. Williams, associate artistic director and co-founder of Company One. Next to me, I have David Leonard, president, Boston Public Library, and Cara Elliott Ortega, who is the chief of arts and culture for the city of Boston. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to have yeah. you. Um, so uh, could you just take a moment, and maybe we'll go in the same order. Could you just give a little visual description, let us know your pronouns and anything else? Yeah. Uh, wow, this is magic it's working. <laughs> um, it's nice to see everybody here. Uh, these are some of my favorite people. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Sean LeCount. I use he, him pronouns. As Alana said, uh, artistic director, one of the co-founders of Company One Theater. I am uh, a relatively tall white man with a shaved head. Um, what else should I say? Anything else? All right, beautiful. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Summer L. Williams, she and her pronouns. Uh, one of the co-founders and associate artistic director of Company One Theater. I am a black woman with sister locks, glasses, pink lipstick, pretty fly kicks. <laughs> Uh, good morning. I'm David Leonard, president of the Boston Public Library. I am a light-skinned white male of Irish descent, if that matters, and uh, graying red hair as a result at this point, and sporting what I consider to be a snazzy fall uh, navy blue jacket. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Cara Elliott Ortega, she, her, hers pronouns. Uh, I am a white Latinx woman uh, with glasses and shoulder-length brown hair. Great. Um, I also um, I meant to mention earlier, so I'll drop it in now. <clears throat> Everybody here has your own lives outside of this room. Uh, people who depend on you, people who may be calling you uh, and needing things from you. Uh, please, if you need to get up and leave the room to take a call or you need to take care of any of your own personal business, please don't worry. Uh, go do what you need to do. Know the camera is right here. So if you can, go around. Great. If you can't, it's not a problem. Um, but just take care of yourselves if you need to. Okay, we are here. Here we are. Uh, I want to just give a little bit of a, like a summary of what this public art for public good 
model is before we get into the, the meat of it. So um, Company One Theater uh, has been awarded $1.25 million through two major grants to support this particular initiative, Public Art for Public Good. And that investment has come from the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, the Boston Public Library, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, that has ensured that Company One, which is now in its uh, 25th, starting 26th, yeah, 26th now, starting like yesterday, uh, 26th season, um, can continue to serve Boston's youngest and most diverse audience with free programs and performances for many years to come. So that's, the, that's, that's what we're here to talk about and where, uh, where that lives in relationship and collaboration with um, the folks who are represented up here today. So I wanna start with a question for Sean and Summer. Um, what sparked this in inquiry into the intersection of public art and public good? Like what does that mean? Uh, and I know that's an enormous question, but let's see if we can figure out the, the, the concise version of that. Sure, I'll start. Um, so Company One's mission is to build community at the intersection of art and social change. Uh, that's what we've been doing for a very long time, and as lots of uh, arts and nonprofit organizations know, how you go about achieving those mission and visions uh, shift, right, over time. So I would say it was about 10 years ago we started to really inquire this concept around what would it mean for the work that we were doing to be a truly a, a public service. Um, we are a 501c3, we felt responsible to that. There are a lot of excellent theater companies in town making good plays. What would it mean for company one to be a public service? And that's really when we started talking to the library and the city about what the opportunities were. Because to be a public service meant we would find ourselves in civic space. Space that didn't belong to us, but belonged to the people. It meant that there'd be uh, accessibility to as far as we could uh, reach, right? Whether that was uh, physical accessibility, whether that was financial accessibility. Uh, but within the American theater, it was also very important to note uh, what is historically a white supremacist system uh, to really think about how do we undo some of that work? How do we uh, make it less elitist? How do we make it open to what is an incredibly diverse, if not sometimes segregated city? And how do we open up our doors, our work, uh, to other organizations who are actually boots on the ground, social justice, making change all the time? And how do we partner with them from the beginning? That was at the premise of this concept. And uh, over time, it took time, and we were talking, David, uh, we gave a beautiful tour of the library yesterday uh, to this cohort, and we had an opportunity to talk about um, how we've learned from each other and how we've continued to do this work better. And doing this work better really just means uh, serving more deeply, more broadly, uh, and with more care through the lens of the art toward a better future. So that's what we've been doing. I'll add that it there's uh, always an internal conversation and an organic conversation. And the thing I think that drove us toward the idea and the like real cementing of the idea was looking at the language that we were using. So community, we talk about community a great deal, but then when you put the words community and theater together, suddenly there's a connotation that is not necessarily the same invitation that we were trying to make that's puzzling. That's weird, sorry, <laughs> that's how I feel. And then we're thinking about this notion of public. And when we think about when uh, public good, there's also a connotation for the public, which means the public that doesn't have the means to actually do the thing or be there. And that is a problem. And so how can we interrogate and reclaim properly, truly, this notion of public, reclaim this notion of community and, and art making space and put it together in a way that is not about uh, a low key classification and trying to um, define a sector, but really reclaiming the true origins of both of those words and figuring out how do we create service around it. Um, thank you. Uh, I know that folks who have been here for the, for the cohort convening might have this information already, but for the benefit of the whole room, 
could you just speak very uh, quickly about uh, how long ago uh, the relationships started with the offices of arts and culture, with the library, and sort of what just sort of maybe a uh, a chronology of that, a very short one. I will do my best. Um, yeah, I do think it was about 10 years we started the conversation. Uh, and we produced our first piece um, in the Rab Hall, the Boston Public Library, um, a piece called uh, Peerless by J.H. Park. And um, uh, that was, I think, 2017. Um, and that piece actually, fun fact, came together because the library convened a group of folks to say, uh, it's the 400th, I think, anniversary of Shakespeare's death. What can we do, right? And at Company One Theater, we said, what if we just don't, no one does Shakespeare for a year? <laughs> a day of absence. Um, but uh, that didn't fly. But what we did do is we um, found a really beautiful piece that uh, was both inspired by and flipped on its head uh, and spoke to our communities. Um, and so that's what we did instead. And the library, to their credit, and I, I tell this story because both it's funny but also valuable to relationship, they said, yeah, we're down. Let's do that. Let's do that, um, which was great. And then uh, the following year, I believe, we produced uh, the world premiere of Leftovers uh, by Josh Wilder at the Strand Theater. Um, and uh, both of these were experiments um, because one of the really important things we've learned to this work is that if we have to hustle every single year to find new venues to do this work, we can't go as deep as we need to because it, it's about creating those relationships. And so one of the most important elements of this is the ongoing promise and relationship with both the city uh, and the library of these multi-year partnerships because every single time it gets better, it gets, and not just for our, um, our team, but for the, the audience and for the participants and everybody coming, um, and it becomes, um, part of those communities in a really deep way, uh, which is important. Um, I'm going to throw this over to David first. Um, David, so uh, this is going to be a question for both of you, but I'll, I'll ask David to answer first. Can you speak a little bit about, from your perspective as sort of uh, a leader in the, in the library, uh, how does the library's ethos and vision and purpose intersect with this notion of public art for public good that Company One is exploring? Um, sure, thanks. And I, I really do want to react to the uh, um, reimagination of Shakespeare on the anniversary a little bit. Um, uh, but but let me let me answer the, the the core question first, which is I think there are two really important, maybe three really important principles at work that that has led us to today. Um, the first of which is what's on the front of the building in Copley Square. Some of you saw yesterday. You heard me talk about free to all. Um, that's our ethos. That is our value, and you know, we can talk about free is not at no cost because someone has to pay for it. Um, so it's real important that we answer that question. But over the last five years in particular, our focus has shifted from the free part to the all part, which I think speaks a little bit to the social justice, community-driven effort um, and set of principles around who is at the table, who is invited in, who has access, and do they see themselves in what is on, on offer? Uh, and so we have an obligation, I think, to make that real. Um, you know, I, I like to think of the library as a 177-year-old startup at this point um, because uh, we must continue reinventing ourselves. We must continue experimenting. Y you could not make a public library today the way they were able to do it in 1848. People would think we were crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and so how is that spirit brought alive today in terms of working out who we are? Philosophically, I think of public libraries today as being at the intersection of education and lifelong learning, um, civic engagement and human, um, human services, but importantly for today's conversation, the arts and culture space. So we are a cultural institution, but we want to be of the community and not just a legacy cultural institution. So all of that is feeding into why this makes sense. And then over the last 10 years, we've been on a journey to um, activate what it means to be a place where programs happen, not just a place where books and information is accessed. Um, and so, 
on that journey um, over 10 years, finding partners who want to engage in that work with us uh, has been very, very essential. And to put a final point on, on, on this, this theory, this ethos, this aesthetic, this is about democratizing access to the arts, uh, to the arts writ large, uh, to the performance arts in particular, and here in terms of, of theater and, and what it means in community. Um, and so th at a high level, that's, that's why it makes sense for us. Um, um, and I'll, I'm sure Kara will add to that. Um, you know, previously it, within the uh, mayor's administration, previously we lived within the arts and culture cabinet. So Kara's actually my former boss. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll pass the microphone in a second. Today we live in, in human services, but we don't stop being an arts and culture organization just because we moved on the org chart. Um, so um, this work is very important uh, for, all of, for all of those reasons. And um, uh, why, why don't I pass it now and I can talk more about the company one relationship a bit later. Great, thanks David. Um, so, so much to say. Um, our relationship with Company One and with Company One being at the Strand Theater has also spanned three mayoral administrations, which I feel like is just worth mentioning. Um, we're incredibly lucky right now to have a super pro arts mayor who just played Rhapsody in Blue at Symphony Hall. So, like, you know, just, I'm very impressed. <laughs> um, and somebody who's really uplifting the idea of access, the idea of um, both free and free for all uh, across a lot of different initiatives and programs right now. So we haven't always had that. So I just want to name that that's a good kind of enabling condition for us. But I think when we think about, um, as the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, the role of arts, the role of publicness, um, our job is to see beyond some of the political wins of those statements, right? So access, free access, um, beautification, right? A lot of the sort of either the very beginning of an experience where you get to walk in for free somewhere or the very end of an artistic experience where there's a product for people to see. Like we get a lot of requests for that and people understand that, people who don't know the artistic process and, and everything that goes behind it. I think at the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, our job is to champion and invest in all of the relationship building and community building behind those cultural expressions and how to make sure that those are really about building on the communities that are here and the energy that's already started from the ground up in Boston in neighborhoods around the city. So how is arts and culture a part of community power building? How is it deepening relationships? How is it deepening social networks? Um, and all of the benefits that come from that, but one of which, which I, I think is expressly political, is building community connection. So for us, we're invested, um, particularly with, with one-time funds that we have from the American Rescue Plan Act, so COVID relief funds, we made a lot of decisions to target those funds in multi-year support for um, events in public space, um, general operating support for organizations, but like really making big bets on work that we feel like is really um, embedded in community of community led by community and about that community agency. And that really gets to, I think, the transformative aspects of arts and culture as, as an individual or, or a person on your block or with your school or whatever that community is, your neighborhood, the Strand, that as a participant, you're invited to actually um, engage in something and learn something about yourself and what you can actually change and do. Um, and so I think that um, uh, for our relationship with Company One in the theater, I mean, this is a theater from 1918. Um, you all, did you all see it? You all went by, okay, the strand, so yeah. So you also know it's like, you know, it needs, needs some TLC, <laughs> but it's also a beautiful, magical space. Um, with so much potential, and I think almost anyone, I mean anyone in the arts who goes in there feels the impact of, of the Strand and what it could be. The city has been engaged in for decades in community process around how to create not just a thriving theater, but a thriving neighborhood there in Upham's Corner. Um, and we are really lucky to also be a city office, um, one of the only arts offices around the country that has um, trained city planners on staff and a cultural planning team. I'm a city planner by training as well. And so we see those, the arts at the intersection of that community development and a lot of those questions, right? How is development happening in this neighborhood? How are we connected to um, the movement building and advocacy that's already underway, including in the art sector, like with Design Studio? You know, a lot of um, creative and cultural groups have been working for a long time in that location to think about what a kind of better 
future for Upham's Corner looks like that really is equitable and diverse and creative. Um, and so for us at the intersection of Company One and their vision, it's a perfect partnership because the programming that they're bringing to the theater just builds on that uh, intersection of cultural work and that community power building work um, and how then we as the city can leverage our public assets to um, be as responsive to community as possible. Thank you. Um, David, did you wanna uh, follow up on the the conversation that yeah, Sean I started? Think, I think, um, first of all, the, the two other things that I think are attractive about the library as a partner in this work um, have been the fact that we have trust in a way that many other institutions do not in community. Um, it, it is, you know, all of the, the Aspen and other studies tell us that, you know, public libraries are still, even today, where it's a little bit more politicized, are still one of the most trusted institutions in society. But we're also in every community. We have 25 branches across the city of Boston. And so it is a gateway to communities writ large. And Boston, after all, is more of a city of neighborhoods in many ways, uh, which is both an asset and sometimes a challenge. Um, so I think that's part of what makes us attractive. But I think the... the um, the game changer, and uh, you know, I will say that um, Company One challenges us to make some of our principles real. Like, okay, you said all this, but but how are we actually going to make it work together? You know, you want to do what? For how long? Um, uh, and then we say, oh, well, okay, if we do it this way, then maybe that'll work. So, and I do think the three-year commitment was a game changer, which is not something we've ever done before because it enabled a little more stability. Uh, we have continued to work with other partners. It's not an exclusive relationship, but the three-year relationship is certainly a, um, a special test or a pilot of a certain way of being in the work together. So I wonder if you, you, you want to react to that as well. I'll just say very briefly, one of the things that I think is really special about our ability to be in the library, um, and it's it's one of the places where I think we felt it for the first time, uh, it became a really beautiful, great equalizer. There's an opportunity to have everyone come into the Rab Hall, and they're going to sit and see and engage with whatever is there, and literally, the person sitting next to you may not know anything about who you are and what you're doing, and you don't know anything about who they are and what they're doing, and they may have come from someplace very different than you. And suddenly, it doesn't matter, right? It is a great equalizing space. There's a great opportunity for everyone to experience dignity in ways that they don't, quite frankly. And I think there's a beauty in that that is often untold but it is certainly felt. And we wanna capitalize on that feeling because that is truly living in that space of public art for public good when we all get into that space and collectively have an experience together despite some of those differences that might be on the surface and some of those differences that often show up and keep us separated. The good in public good is social and community exactly. at the end of the day. Exactly. I'm wondering, um, one of the challenges, I think, across the country, across arts and culture, is how to um, cultivate resource, how to um, make the case to the people who are able to uh, uh, disseminate resource. And resource is a lot of different things. I don't just mean money, right? I mean time, attention. Uh, lot, there's lots of ways we could talk about resource, right? But it's what we need in order to make our work. So I'm wondering um, for everybody up here, and we can popcorn, how do you, <laughs> how do you think about um, making the case for resource for this kind of public art for public good. And that, that's a really broad opening. Um, you can take that in whatever way makes sense to you in your particular work. But how, how, do, we, how do we make this case um, effectively or creatively, right? I think maybe that's the question. Only because <laughs> um, it, I, I think it's so connected to what I just said. How can you know something if you don't experience it? How do you understand it? We have to get folks to get in the room, to actually feel and experience the thing in action. Because sometimes the words on paper aren't gonna do it. The presentation isn't gonna do it. The numbers aren't going to do it. But the feeling, the feeling 
is the thing that carries you and the thing that fuels you to discover like, all right, so how can we figure out how to get this on paper as accurately as possible? How do we figure out how to make sure it's accessible and felt through that presentation? But if folks don't have that uh, organic experience for themselves, it's really difficult to communicate. And I think we need to start there most of the time. And I want to add a clarifying thing because I know uh, in some ways you both represent offices or organizations that distribute resource, right? But you have to, res you have to acquire resource yourself in order to do that. Oh, well, we definitely have both sides of that, yeah. uh, both of those hats. Um, I do think, you know, the experience part that you just referenced is essential. And, you know, if we think about the three or four pieces of work, this body of work that we've now done, I would like to say, together, um, that has a message unto itself. Um, but part of this has to be driven, I think, by the moral and social obligation to make it, make it come to life. Um, and so that's compelling, but it also takes champions and leadership. Uh, we have a very strong, uh, I have a very strong deputy, Michael Colford, who has been a champion of this work and has a, a theater background to some extent. And so uh, he, he's able to say, no, we're going to do this, right? So, so I think a lot of this is about the will um, and it is then about convincing, you know, whether it's our internal resources, our partner resources, or external funders, that uh, this really is very, very important. And it's not, which is why I love the topic of this panel, it's not the art for art's sake. It, it is art for what it brings about, building community. Um, you know, we're going through now an epidemic of loneliness in the country among an, all the other challenges we've got. So anything that builds connectivity, com community, the ability to see yourself and your possibility uh, right in front of you on a stage in a safe community space, these are the compelling messages that need to get uplifted in, the, in this work together. Yeah, I would add, I mean, um, it's an interesting question for me right now, because like I mentioned, we, we've been able to make some really amazing investments through American Rescue Plan Act funding, which has to be committed, uh, you know, like yesterday and spent down by the end of um, calendar year 2026. And for a city like Boston, our, um, our arts office has an annual budget of $4.5 million. We're one of the um, lowest per capita funding for the art cities in the country. And that's, that's kind of our baseline. Um, things like the American Rescue Plan Act really changed that and gave us a chance to feel what it feels like to have things be more fully resourced, to be able to make some, some big investments that we normally wouldn't be able to make to do multi-year grants, right? As a city, we normally can't do multi-year grants. So I think we've tried really hard to leverage that opportunity as much as possible um, and to be smart and to be kind of co-conspirators with our grantee partners and people doing the work to see how we can leverage public funds for private funds, for storytelling, for other kinds of things. But I think um, there's also a challenge on us in the art sector to really demonstrate what it is that we've done um, and how we've used those public dollars for public good and um, what the impact of that really is. And I was in an advocacy space with a couple people in this room not that long ago where I was like, I'm interested in winning. You know, like I'm interested in kind of saying the arguments that we need to say, the way we need to say them, properly resourcing those campaigns and that messaging and that research so that if we need to make a public health argument, we're making a public health argument because we know that that's true, right? If we need to make an economic argument, we can do that because we know that that's true too. Um, and that, so I would like us to be kind of, um, working at that level so that we can not leave sort of any stone unturned. Um, but I do think that this framework and this kind of conversation is really important because we also don't always have a great narrative, kind of unified narrative together, at least to government, um, of what that value is. And I think that this is a really compelling framework um, that a lot of different kinds of artistic work can fall under. And if just like everybody, you know, the number of people in this room picked up the phone to the mayor's office and gave this message and talked about how important it was, there would be a lot more people who are advocating to my boss, you know, than there would have been yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of even, um, like, very sort of basic city level, pick up the phone, call your city councilor kind of work is hugely important um, on the public funding side. So amplifying that, I heard clearly a call to action. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, we need some help sector so let's get on the phone tuning in from home get on the phone 
Um, I appreciate that. I also, the artists in the room know this. I want to um, just amplify quickly the resource that is collaboration. Yeah, please. Um, and I mean deep collaboration. I don't mean like fiscal partnership. Deep collaboration is in itself a resource and one that in uh, a sector of scarcity, whether that's local or nationally, uh, I don't take for granted. Um, artists, we all know about the value of collaboration. Uh, institutionally, um, it's changed everything, right? And I think that's, that's incredibly important for this conversation. These are not, you know, we are able to have deep conversations with our partners around this work. It is not transactional anymore. It started that way because that's how they all start sometimes. Um, and I also just want to say that we, you know, in addition to the BPL, uh, and the city, uh, and thank you for the resource that you've provided financially, but also the, the brain trust. Like we, we talk about with, with David and Michael and Car like what are we gonna do together? Um, and there's always room for growth there, but that's incredibly valuable because we're considering the people we're serving and working with while we're doing it, right? And it's, it's not just the occupation of a space thing. Uh, and I, I just want to make sure, too, we, we, we quickly glossed over it, but um, I have to say, you know, the Barr Foundation uh, got underneath this initiative with us in a way that made it um, really foundational in our ability to do this with health. And, and thank the Lord, as our uh, cohort knows, uh, Stephanie and the Mellon Foundation are allowing us to explore this model with other models and other theater companies who are social justice focused, intentionally multiracial, doing this across the country. And that's actually what we're doing here today. Uh, and this weekend. And so uh, I, I see this as a foundational piece with the future, right? And we're, we're talking about that today as well. Because we're no longer alone, right? It no longer feels like we are alone. We are finding each other. And being able to find each other means that there's an opportunity then for other folks to find other people, right? There's an opportunity here that is so steeped in connection. Go ahead. I, th I think we're also approaching a moment where um, you know, we now have three years of collaboration or close to it uh, under our belt uh, beyond what was possible on the closer to the more transactional level. We, we've had the benefit of this, um, uh, these special funds for a period of time. Right now we do have a mayor and an administration in the city and a governor in the Commonwealth who are all aligned around understanding the values so our opportunity has to be to capitalize on this as a broader community and demonstrate what, what is possible so that there's sustainability in this work together and others join us uh, in this work. Um, you know, I, I do not know that the library has always been thought of as the center or the platform through which this can happen. Uh, it's ironic that the library is not great at telling its own story in this work um, because we are the repository of stories in many ways. 23 million of them, if you care to know. But um, uh, you know, th this, this is our, our contribution here has to be about, um, I think, articulating our role as platform for this work. And it's not just a platform that is used, but it is one that is in partnership with uh, many people in this room, as well as those of you on stage. Um, so one thing I want to pull a thread on, we have a, just a couple more minutes, but I'd be curious to hear um, perspectives. Um, Sean, you pointed at the, the nature of long-term collaboration and its uh, power as a resource and what it means to be in brain trust with folks. Um, and one of the things that I know from experience and that I think is worth saying out loud is that that doesn't mean that those collaborations are easy. Right, And that there is, I think, what has, in my view, proven very true over time is that the, the points of friction or, um, or misunderstanding or uh, divergent desires have been part of paving the road towards strong collaboration. So I'm curious if you guys want to, if anybody wants to speak, you don't have to speak about like a particular issue of, of contention, but I'm wondering how that, how that resonates for you. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, you, and certainly in, in, on the ground, it is, what, what do you mean you don't have a backstage? How are we going to do a production without a backstage, right? Um, 
you know, uh, so or or you we need security because we're not sure about uh, what the population response is going to be. Some of these are controversial topics. So it's working through those things, and certainly for us internally, it has as much been about bringing our own staff along as it has been about shifting to a model that can facilitate that. So so it has to be the the community as a whole. Um, that that adopts this model. And I think when you see it produced, like, oh, I get it now. I now I know why this is important. But the work up front to get there uh, is is not without challenging. And I appreciate the fact that everybody else on this panel could throw stones at us for being difficult on occasion. But but I, I hope I take pride in the fact that we we work through we work through it and get there rather than get that stuck. That certainly was not the point of the question. <laughs> I'm giving the microphone away. We here now, David. We made it to the panel. We got through it. But there is no backstage. No. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about facilities related issues, I don't know. I can't even. Yeah. Um, no, but I think um, I think other things that come to mind are actually some of the other public spaces that we're trying to activate through different kinds of partnerships. So City Hall Plaza is another place where we've been able to. Um, staff and fund um, more intentional cultural programming, really thinking about like how can we use not just the Strand Theater, you know, a theater theater, but other spaces as venues um, for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. And um, there are not a lot of spaces in Boston to do festival type um, outdoor productions. Um, we haven't had the infrastructure for it before on the plaza, went through a big renovation. And so we had a, a lot of people kind of coming out of the woodwork saying, I wanna do this thing, I have a vision for a thing. and um, and you know, figuring out how to get in a like a very kind of operational production way, like from point A to point B of what someone's trying to do, um, and what they can do and can't do, what we can pay for and not pay for. I mean, like real nitty gritty stuff, but also just being um, kind of like a facilitating department between the artists or organization and our property management office and our security team and all of these other things, and trying to. Uh, articulate, well, we're trying to get to this thing, we don't know what it looks like yet, um, but we're gonna kind of lean into not knowing and just like the tensions around that. And sometimes it works really well, sometimes it doesn't work as well. But I think again, like multi-year commitments are an opportunity to say like, this is a trusting space where we're gonna try again and we're gonna try to learn and we're gonna be able to give each other feedback. And I feel like we don't have enough opportunities for that. I'm curious, uh, Summer or Sean, um, sort of a little wrap up on this. Do you wanna speak at all about how the company one culture and ethos kind of values the uh, the commitment to working through the things that aren't working and figuring out how to make that part of a strong ongoing relationship. Uh, so at Company One Theater, we are an intentionally multiracial, uh, multi-experience organization, and that's top to bottom, from board to leadership to staff to audience to student to teacher. Um, we encourage uh, the value of different perspective and conflict. Uh, I've got staff in the audience right now who are grinning at me when I say that. Um, but uh, conflict is a really important way to move through our work. And sometimes it's hard, I find, when we start a relationship with an, an institution who doesn't know us, um, we try to tell it like it is. Uh, we try to name the values clearly out front. We try to play nice. Um, but it's important that we're doing um, things that align with the mission and values as our communities have lifted those things up and trusted them over time, right? And I think the other thing here is um, we talk about, you know, moving at the speed of trust. Um, and yes, there is the like top level security and all that, but then like you talk about getting into the strand and we have to earn the trust of these ushers, right? And these ushers, it's like church. These ladies have been there forever. And if we're just another in and out at the Strand, another, um, you know, it's the, the, the building and the theater has the opportunity to just host a number of things that roll over. We're in residence there for five weeks every summer. Um, and to build trust with those folks, that's, that's a first step in building trust with the community, right? To make sure the security there is really attached to the work we're doing and knows they're part of the team and is necessary and we gotta care for each other. Um, because the other part of what we do in the library and the Strand is they are both incredibly open and fluid spaces. Yeah. We were talking to some of our theater partners from across the country and they were like, 
wait a minute, people can just walk in and walk out of the space as it's happening? And like, is that disrespectful to the artists? But that's part of the nature, right? When we're at the library, we are saying, um, you can come in and we've had people walk, walk into the theater and be like, what is this? They're like, well, it's, it's a play at the library? Yeah, can I come back? Yeah, is it free? Yeah, um, okay, I'm gonna leave now, okay? Um, and the nature, I mean, the Strand literally doesn't have doors in the theater. If you're in the lobby, you're in the theater. Like it's, uh, and, and that becomes like part of the energy of the thing, right? Uh, we don't care how you dress, we don't care how, you know, you show up, you're part of it. I'm gonna, um, we are at, a, we're at a moment of pause, so I'm gonna take just a second, I wanna pull a couple threads together and do a moment of housekeeping. Um, here's what I'm hearing. Uh, I'm hearing about de-siloing arts and culture from itself as well as de-siloing it as something that is separate from the health of communities as a whole. I'm hearing a commitment across the board for organizations and institutions and government offices to collaborate in new ways and to rethink what a resource looks like. Um, I'm also hearing one of the reasons why these uh, relationships have been so long lasting is there's a willingness to actually look at the truth of a matter and to figure out problem solving from multiple directions that is rooted in values and mission, always. Um, something that I know to be true is when, when these relationships started and as they have continued, it comes back to values and mission from all sides and that those decisions are influenced uh, and move forward in collaboration from that starting point. I'm also hearing uh, this really great moment you said about the library is really trusted by the community and that that is a resource, right? That that's a leverage that can be applied across the board. Um, I heard about the power of creative problem solving and about, um, Kara, I think you said uh, that it, it's an exploration of community power building, right? That, that that's part of what you are so invested in and then that is why these relationships and collaborations are of value across the board. Um, and that there's a, a necessity for flexibility and a, and a curiosity and a trust in experimentation. That the experiments have to be run in order for us to know what works. Um, so I'm really grateful to each of you for sharing um, so personally and deeply about the work you're doing. I know it's just surface level, we're just here for a very short amount of time for this panel, but there's so much more to say. So here's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna take a break until 11.15. And in that time, I'm gonna ask you each to clear your seats of your items because the room is going to be reset. Um, if you need to stash your stuff, there's a nice little spot out in the alcove or in the back and there's a place to hang your coats. Um, we're gonna spend 15 minutes resetting the space, then we're gonna reconvene for an inner circle, outer circle conversation. What is that? I'll tell you about it when you come back. Um, <laughs> All right, please have a great break, take a break. If you're on the next panel, please take an actual break. Thank you. Uh, you are welcome to find a new seat if you uh, are still looking, if, if we're playing a little musical chairs. If there's not enough chairs, Julia, will you raise your hand? If there's not enough chairs, Julia will help. Um, welcome back and welcome back to our live stream, friends. We are in a whole new uh, architecture here. Um, this is inner circle, outer circle. Uh, once again, I'm Alana. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I am your facilitator on duty. Um, so I'm gonna explain the inner circle, outer circle model, but I'm actually, uh, instead of extemporaneously doing this, I'm actually just gonna read it because HowlRound has written a very nice explanation. Uh, okay. The inner circle, outer circle format is a discussion strategy used by HowlRound in which a pre-selected group of speakers sit in an inner circle, that's y'all, uh, surrounded by an outer circle of the rest of the participants in the room. Guided by a moderator, the inner circle speaks in conversation for about 45 minutes while the outer circle listens. After 45 minutes, the moderator, that's again me, opens the conversation to the outer circle and all participants are invited to speak. The goal of the conversation format is to surface multiple perspectives on a specific topic. Um, we are 
we are hopeful and we expect um, divergent takes on the questions. Um, we're not looking for consensus. We're looking for a conversation in which people have their own particular points of view. And I will just say, hi. I'm so sorry that my back is to you. Um, it's the nature of the architecture, but um, I love you all and I'm not ignoring you. Uh, uh, also, hello. Um, so uh, we're gonna be in this sort of inner circle for a little bit, as I mentioned, but I wanna be very clear that everybody in the room is in the conversation. Um, and everybody in the room has an equal voice, uh, an equal um, access to speaking what you need to speak. So if we get to a point and you've got something you really have to say uh, when we get to this outer circle, like don't be shy. Um, we're going to be using mics, that's true for everybody that's gonna be speaking, um, inner circle and outer circle. We ask that you use a mic so that um, it can be captured adequately for um, all of our access needs. Uh, and I will also ask that we speak slowly and clearly, um, which everybody's doing so far anyway. Uh, so let me, let me introduce this amazing group of people who are sitting around this inner circle. Um, once we go around, uh, I will ask if when it comes your turn or when you choose to speak, if you could provide a visual description of yourself uh, the first time you take the mic. Um, so uh, let's see, I've got to go in an order. Okay, Allison. Hi, Allison. Uh, we have Allison Yuming Chu, who's the execu executive director of Chung Stage. Uh, we have Jaronzi. Jaronzi's right there. Uh, Jaronzi Harris, who is an artist, um, a member of the Dorchester Weather Theater Ensemble and The Lot Next Door. Uh, we have Kenneth Bailey right here. Hi, Kenneth. Um, who is the founder and the methodology and strategy director for Design Studio for Social Intervention, which is abbreviated to DS4SI. Uh, we have Catherine Morris right here, uh, who is the founder and artistic director um, of the Boston Art and Music Soul Festival, otherwise known as BAMS Fest, to those who know, which is an amazing, amazing festival. It's also the director of arts and culture for the Boston Foundation. Uh, Stephanie Ibarra, right here, who is the program officer for arts and culture for the Mellon Foundation. And we have Sue Ellen Kroll, Sue Ellen, Sue Ellen's right there, uh, the senior program officer for arts and creativity for the Barr Foundation. And we have Cynthia, who, oh my God, Cynthia, Cynthia, can you please tell me your title? Director of POW Arts Center. Thank you, Cynthia Wu. Um, so, uh, did I miss anybody? Everybody's, Sean is still here. Summer is still here. Oh, my gosh, Kara is still here. Um, thank you. Thank you. My paper didn't have everything. Um, okay, so our goals for this conversation are to expand out and build on what we started in the panel. Um, I am curious for us to broaden our lens and explore other ways of thinking about public art, public good, thinking about investment in the intersection of public art and public good. Um, and really specifically, this conversation is not a panel. That first one, panel. This one, not a panel. Um, so you don't need to feel any obligation to uh, prove what you're doing um, or to speak on behalf of your program or your initiative. Um, we uh, were able to access um, more information about all of these organizations and all of the work you're doing. So I want to make sure that you know that you're not, you should not feel any pressure to prove anything in the room about the value of what you do. And I say that because there is an inherent tension in this particular gathering of people. We have a collection of artists, administrators, funders, people who wear multiple hats, people, hmm? yeah. <laughs> people who, are, who are gatekeepers and people who are knocking on the gates. And sometimes those are the same people. So I just want to say that, that is, uh, that's a tension that exists here. And uh, it's worth just being really clear about it. So, our goal, my goal, is to hold a space that is really transparent and um, warm and um, open-hearted for us to together try and point at some of the things we see around us that are bright spots um, locally and nationally for those who have a national view, um, but as well as obviously locally since that's our focus today. Um, 
what are some bright spots that you're seeing um, either in the work that you're doing or the work that you're facilitating, the work of collaborators that you, uh, that you witness in the work that around you, um, stuff that you've seen other people do, you don't know a lot of detail, but it seems really great and cool and you want to know more. Uh, feel free to name check those things as we go through, and that's for everybody. Um, so the other thing I want to say is that Certainly this is true of the inner circle, and I know for dang sure it's true in so many ways of the outer circle. Many people in this room have many different kinds of relationships with one another. Many different kinds of collaborations. Many different kinds of um, power dynamic relationships uh, that just, just know that that is also in the room. So um, if you feel, as you're speaking, if you want to, if you feel a need to kind of like be clear about the positionality from which you are providing an answer or information, you can feel free to do that, but you don't have to. Um, okay, so before we kick off, um, does anybody have any questions about this format or concerns? All right, great. Um, fantastic. So uh, I am going to kick us off with a prompt and we're just gonna popcorn around and I will do my best to continue to pull threads together and we're gonna do this until about 12 o'clock. Um, and that is, you know, like a little over half an hour from now. We'll go, we can maybe go a little bit longer than that and then we'll expand out to the outer circle. We're technically supposed to end this moment at like 12.30, but uh, the HowlRound team has offered additional time uh, to go to 12.40. So if you, have to, if you were planning to leave at 12.30, just know that that's okay. Just go if you need to go. Um, all right, so here we go. Uh, and a reminder to state your name and pronouns and a visual description once uh, you take the mic. So thinking about the models of public art making that have been discussed or not discussed, something in your mind, uh, and thinking about investment in public art making, um, what are the bright spots for you right now? What, what's exciting for you? What's given you hope about public art? Hello, there, right back. Uh, about um, public art making and investment in public art making, and that's a broad category of stuff. Who wants to start? And Jaranzi has the mic, but that doesn't mean you have to begin. You can pass the mic. I'll be in, I have the mic. Nice. <laughs> uh, my name is Dronzi Harris. I use she, her pronouns. I am a dark-skinned black woman with twisted hair and a green dress and a denim jacket. And I would say a bright spot for me is honestly being here today. This is so exciting to be on this national platform. I'm an artist, I am a Boston resident. And uh, in 2022, I had an art residency with the city of Boston, which produced a play in my neighborhood about my neighborhood. And now that play is in further development with Company One. And so I would say that, um, you know, a bright spot is this, this uh, yeah, the city's investment, Company One's investment, all my, yeah, partner's investment and, you know, the work that, me and my, my neighbors are doing. The lot next door. The lot next door is a play um, centered on a city on lot in my neighborhood in Dorchester. Um, it's actually right next door to the house I've lived in for um, a decade. And uh, it's about uh, our advocacy and I would say neighborhood dynamics regarding its development. Um, and uh, through the work, we're engaging local residents, neighbors in producing the play and also advocating for the law itself to remain public land to um, ideally be green space. Thank you. Who wants to take it? Who's next? Cynthia. I never voluntarily speak near the beginning, so this is this is something. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, note, note in your notes. Uh, my name is Cynthia Wu. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am director of Power at Center. I am an Asian woman with uh, dark black hair and a ponytail and glasses, wearing a black shirt and 
turquoise pants. <laughs> um, I, I do, I think I feel compelled to speak because I do feel like, um, you know, for context, Powell Art Center is, it's eight years old this year. It's part of a social service agency, BCNC, in partnership with um, <clears throat> a community college, Bunker Hill Community College. And I think to hearken back to the panel, the, the idea of time and how it really takes time for relationships to happen, I think even within internally, within my own organization as a uh, and um, Bunker Hill, like finding our way and building that trust with people who don't work in our sector, uh, the arts and culture sp sector specifically. Um, and we're having a real moment where we're really lucky to have funding from City of Boston, Mellon Foundation for the and Monument Project. We did a cultural plan um, in, in partnership with the City of Boston and Metropolitan Planning Area Council that involved lots of organizations in Chinatown. And I feel like there's this moment where we're suddenly realizing how much, one, historically Chinatown and organizations in Chinatown have been using arts and culture as part of their strategy all this time but also a moment where I'm in a position where we're actually having funding that it doesn't have to be just the scrappy <laughs> eight organizations making their own you know, master plan and then coming together to make a cultural plan, but thinking about at this moment for the next two years, two, three years at least, having some of that funding and support um, that we can make some of those things a reality that the neighborhood and community members have articulated in their cultural plan, the master plan, because I think that's always the hardest work. You come up with a plan and how does that realize itself? And we're in a position where we actually have support and then there's that movement to do some of these things in public spaces, think about the good of the community. Um, so those things are coming together. Now, past three years, you know, I, I don't know about that. We'll have to think about that. That's what we're working on the building blocks for, right? To continue the work and make it sustainable. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my name is Stephanie, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am a light-skinned Latinx, Chicanx um, woman in a black dress, sporting my dad's curls and cowboy boots. Um, and I'm just thinking about, I really appreciate starting in on bright spots, because I was, I was rolling in uh, hot, coming in hot with some like general, like um, uh, how do you say it, like, the soapbox energy, and I'm, so that's not this, and this is great. But I'm, I'm really thinking about the bright spot of specifically the intersection and the, the relationship building that is the Strand Theater and the City of Boston and Boston Public Library and Design Studio and Company One. And I won't pretend, I'm just learning about it, so I won't pretend to know like every nuance of the relationship, but that 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 constellation of institutions is now a unit in my mind is now a little constellation in my mind and um, it still feels too rare that the deep relationship building and the long term um, sort of vision and organizing across um, uh, city agencies and funders and what have you and across scale um, that still doesn't happen as often as I would love to see it happen. And so it's a massive bright spot. And it, and it signals to me, and then I'll just lift up selfishly as like the, a person who is sitting currently in a seat at a foundation, having spent almost 30 years in various seats in theaters. I'll lift up also the bright spot that is Company One and Mosaic and Crowded Fire and Perseverance and Cleveland Public, um, all here for this theater convening, and the ways that like we that I feel invited in um, and held as like my whole self, and and that I I, start, I share that back into that constellation piece because it feels like um, a group of humans um, are operating from abundance from human like a humanity centered place, and it feels like that is the thing by which we are actually maybe have a shot in hell of moving some needles. Hi, my name is Alison Chu. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I'm the executive director of Trunk Stage Boston's Asian American Theater Company. I am Asian. I'm an Asian woman um, in sh mid length, short um, to short brown hair, um, and in a beige sweater. 
Um, I wanted to name some of my bright spots in a couple of um, sort of higher flying uh, points and go into some specifics. Some of my um, bright spots right now are partnerships and different ways of storytelling and the funding and the investments. Um, I, so I'm excited to share that just very recently, Trunk Stage is moving into, uh, as Boston's Asian American Theater Company, in residency at Boston Center for the Arts, and also produce Producing, thank you. Um, also, at the same time, producing community rooted multilingual works in neighborhoods like Boston Chinatown. We announced a new season full of the three things that I just named. Uh, one of them, one of the first of them being um, um, specifically, we want to channel sort of um, the investment, um, our institutional investment into new work and specifically, specifically community rooted new work uh, produced in a Boston specific community context. Uh, we are producing a uh, Filipino-American playwright's work about a Filipino child's immigrant journey and the self-reckoning uh, of this sort of in um, uh, under a theater's roof, but also at the same time, this travels around Boston to take place and under many theaters' roof. I'm ex incredibly excited about that. That is produced in partnership with Company One, and I wanted to, to really underline how collectively we make things like that possible. I also wanted to name sort of the different ways of storytelling in the context of um, what is the hyper-local part of this in relationship to public art. So um, the other project that I'm incredibly excited about is a um, brand new musical theater project called Boston Chinatown Stories of Our Streets. It is music, brand new music, songs written from and about um, and originated um, with stories and oral interviews of Boston Chinatown residents' stories and interviews with them. So what's really special about this is that ultimately these stories that actually belong to the local neighborhood is being sung on the streets where they live. That is being performed and sung out in the ultimate passion and joy back to where uh, the, the neighborhood and the spaces that they take up. Um, this uh, project is also being generously inv uh, invested by the City of Boston and the Mellon Foundation. So all of that gives me so much hope around um, how um, we are reimagining public art under theater's roof, outside, on the streets, in the neighborhoods, and at the same time, what are stories? What are What is new work in this context? What does new work mean when it belongs to Boston and performs to Boston? Well, I got this mic from Cynthia, so I think that might mean I'm up. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Sue Ellen Kroll, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a white woman with brown hair, wearing various shades of purple today with some glasses. Um, thank you for having me here. I think um, when I think of bright spots, I was going to reflect on some inspiring conversations that I've had recently, and um, that have really shifted the conversations um, that I was having when I first started at the Bar Foundation. And I also was new to philanthropy. I was started there seven years ago. I came from doing my own public programs as well, writing my own grants to institutions. And we also gave out small community grants um, at my previous organization. And when I came to Bar, I learned the phrase broken business model. And I didn't really know what that meant. And it was told to me, it's like, oh, well, these are organizations that can't you know, break even, and they have a broken business model. And I was like, oh, well, and you know, then fast forward, and so we did a lot of talk around how this shows up in the arts, and, not and how and why it shows up in the arts. But I have been on a string of amazing conversations in the past six months where that phrase is no longer <laughs> gonna be allowed. It is vetoed and we have come to say, there's not a market solution for this type of work. And when we do see it, we see what that looks like 
$500 tickets, um, and that is, and a few winners on that. And so we are just now in a space saying, this is what it takes to do this work. And these are conversations that take retraining at the funding level, at the boards and governance level, and at staff levels around how we think about make, taking risk. And I think this is a conversation that I've been lucky enough to be engaged with with Company One over many years around shifting your business model and thinking about that risk to be contributed and to say, we can't do this work. And we see when people are expecting it to break even, the levels of inequity that have entered our sector around pay for staff, the amount of time that happens. And so it's been heartening for me to see, and all the other ways around choices, so I hear this come out with other organizations that say, well, we need the blockbusters so that we can pay for the seats, and we can't do the artistic programming we want to do, and the staff wants to do, the board is making us do this. And that conversation is really been picking, getting picked apart right, right now in a really great way, and that there's new alternative models that people are talking about, and also thinking about many of these things are going to be more focused on contributed revenue than earned revenue. I had a feeling the mic was going to come over here. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Catherine T. Morris, she, her pronouns. Uh, even though you all cannot see it, I am relatively tall as well, Sean. Um, I have a beautiful crown, AKA Afro. I wear glasses. Uh, I have a rainbow scarf, uh, black blazer, and long pants, black pants. Um, I wear 157 hats, so I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but the bright spots for me um, coming into this work as a cultural strategist, that's how I see my work. Um, Boston was very different 10 years ago, and what has been beautiful to see, one, the resources, and not just financial, human, shared capital, space, um, the ability to, to collaborate, uh, the ability to just dream has been incremental over time because creatives and artists have taken back their autonomy and their agency to imagine the city the way that they want it to be. And that wasn't always a thing 10 years ago. Um, and part of that has been this interesting tension with philanthropy <laughs> and the arts and culture sector, um, but I've watched the power dynamic shift. One, because language has shifted, so I appreciate that. Um, but two, creating the space in which you can just try things without KPIs, outcomes, outputs, which philanthropy has done historically, but knowing that um, the people that have been hired, the people who have advocated internally inside philanthropy um, are leaning into the expertise and the experts of community and artists and creatives to drive those outcomes versus it being the other way around. And I have found that beautifully, um, not only a bright spot, but just such a North Star about how Boston should continue to work in that direction but also this entire planet, not just, the, not just this, these un-United States. Um, but the other piece uh, that has been a bright spot for me um, that I've appreciated is the activation of green space, our park system, that has always been available to us, uh, may have some rules now, <laughs> but dreaming up what a lot next door or park up the street can be, and anyone can have access to that. And from a, a, a very spiritual standpoint, how these green spaces ground us and recenter our humanity. And if we're out there long enough, you'd be surprised the magic that can happen. So, bright spots. Thank you. I'm Kenneth Bailey, um, he, him, co-founder of Design Studio for Social Intervention. I have on a grayish, dark gray, big t-shirt sweater, kind of mud brown pants, white shoes. I'm about 5'6", five, 5'5". Five, five. <laughs> and I would say 
upright spot comes from the conversation earlier around all of the entry points into the discussion around publicness um, and sort of the arts taking seriously public life or public space. And I wanna make a, um, a advocacy. Let's start a public lab. Because there's so many of us who are all trying to think about what does it mean to reinvent public life? What does it mean to intervene in public culture? And I'm like, well, then why aren't we labbing up? Like, why aren't we like literally like looking at each other's interventions? Like, let's let's make a lab of it. Um, and my other um, thought is, um, what an exciting opportunity it would make to have more of us really thinking about transforming the public culture of the city because then there are more eyes really taking a critical look at the contemporary re regular culture of the city and having to be more flat-footed and sort of objective about what public life is like in Boston currently still. Um, I know one of the ways we talk about Boston is as a city of neighborhoods. And that frame, you know, there's a lot of pride in it, but um, the other side of it is that the inside of the city is a white city. Um, and so what do we do to really think about what, how we want to change um, Boston if we want Boston to look more like this, even down here where it doesn't, um, we have to get really clear about the contemporary state of public culture. So I'm really excited about that. I think we can make it happen. And I'm gonna stop there. I'm loving these. Um, I'm gonna throw out uh, an additional prompt that we can continue talking about bright spots, but um, Kenny, your, your, uh, your provocation, I think is a really important one. Like, let's dream for a minute. Knowing the bright spots that we've got in our pockets and even the ones we haven't mentioned out loud yet, um, what do we dream about in terms of public art and public good? How it's resourced, what it could look like, how it could connect. Um, what do you think of when I, when I ask you to dream about that? Um, I think my dreams were just voiced by Kenny in many ways, um, which I appreciate. The lab, scenario. Um, at Company One Theater, we're intentionally itinerant, right? We don't have a building. We don't have ownership. Um, we belong to the city and everywhere we go. Um, we belong to the folks we're working with. And uh, We've been asked many times, you know, what would it take to land? You know, you, you're a theater, you need a theater. Um, that's not going to do it. But what might do it uh, is the concept of a community center. Um, and that community center, in my visioning uh, and in my dreams, is um, not just an artistic community center, but one where I am confounded by the incredible ideas of the design studio, where, um, where there's a food security resource, where there's child care, where, there's, uh, where we're really um, a bigger part of something, uh, where we're not just another art center, uh, which is important, but we have those. Um, so I think a lot about that, and I have to say, like, Karthik gives me a hard time, Kat, because he always says, um, you and Kat always talk about, like, I know we're talking about bright spots, but um, you always talk about how um, there's a, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'll use my own words, but um, I, I'm from here. I want to be proud of who we are. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, we started a theater company. For my, my per, we, a lot of people started our theater company. My personal perspective was I wanted, I was young and foolish. I just wanted to start something that I could actually feel proud of that was like cool. I wanted something cool. <laughs> and even in my old age, last night sitting uh, at Comfort Kitchen, uh, hearing Kat say, uh, yeah. Like this city, we just we just want to move forward with things that are cool. And why is it so damn hard? And why does the nightlife shut down so early? And you know, I'm why going right I, after you now. <laughs> you know, because they're the people that we want to be with, and the powers um, that be sometimes just feel like they make it extra hard, whether that's transportation or housing costs, whatever it might be. And so. Um, do a dance court till midnight. They're like, no, stop it at 11. I know. 
I know we have to we have to settle for our pre-show, but we're we're, we're getting there, right? <laughs> um, but there are a lot of bright spots in the process, and I have to just say to the element of the cool. Um, there's a lot of people in the outer circle who I feel this way about, and right here, right? I'm looking at what Allison and Jaronzi and, and Cynthia and Kenny and Ke like these are cool institutions locally, right? And it's hard to exist on your own, and so we lift each other up. I mean, we know this, but man, we don't. We don't do it enough, I think. So that, that, that to me is the thing. Oh, sure, thank you. I was gonna bring that up, Sean, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so dream, I love to dream. I dream all day, actually. I'm so glad to be here instead of work. Um, <laughs> couple of dreams. One is I, I had the great fortune and misfortune of working for um, a startup accelerator that's very known in the Commonwealth. I won't mention their name. But the building that they were in was, was the dream in that it is a shipyard arsenal that's like 50 million square feet. And I'd walk in and out of this building, I'm like, what would it be like if artist housing, artist space, um, a, a, a rooftop greenhouse, a creative marketing services, childcare, two event space, like all the things that can be housed where people can coexist, barter, build together and be able to have their own destination and they can be proud of that they have a stake in, they're an equity partner, they co-op, whatever it needs to be. But that's so that it doesn't get to the end of looking up and saying we don't have, because it's already housed within. So that dream of not just space for space, but really about um, longevity and sustainability in which I have found historically arts and culture has had to prove and beg for and it's just like if we actually literally bring all of what we have right find the gaps and find the people that do the thing but you have all that housed in 50 million square feet you're talking about a 24th neighborhood <laughs> where people literally can find themselves of of belonging to but also being able to give be given the freedom to imagine differently because that building, the, the physical space of that, but also a place you can just go to because there's not enough of that in our city, right? So that's one dream. Um, and I've always, my second dream is, yes, Boston's not cool enough because we lack soul. And soul is a word that's never associated with our city. I want my city to be soulful, right? But I realized that how our city and our commonwealth has been designed we're one of the most regulated commonwealths and states. We got double laws. <laughs> there's things on the books for those that don't know. Like there, there's places you need a dance permit still. And it makes no sense. <laughs> the city hates dance. It's quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but like that, that, that blue law we haven't been able to challenge. I'm like, who doesn't want to dance every now and again, you know? <laughs> I hear you, Ken, it's been sitting on my heart. So, you know, part of what the second dream is about um, how do we collectively, because we all have it, right? We all have a voice, um, how to uh, minimize, eliminate certain things that prevent humanity to exist because dancing is a form of expression, and when people can't express themselves, other things happen, right? It affects crime rate, all their stuff, right? So th this advocacy piece, policy design, policy change, is really critical right now of a dream that I have of, I run into many artists and creatives that hate that word because there's trauma associated with it, right? Their relationship with their, their city council or, or state legislator is horrible, right? But part of that is, well then how would you define it but still be able to meet with your city councilor and your state legislation, let them see your face enough to which you are, are annoying them and then they will have no choice but to listen and bring seven friends with you because that's all you need to make an issue. But that advocacy piece is so critical because people are making decisions without even knowing you about your life and your business and your creative practice. I'm done. 
Yeah, I w um, I, in the spirit of like moving from panel into conversation, I'm, I wanna offer in a couple of things. This is Stephanie speaking for those of you at home. Um, but the, I'm curious about the word dream in the context of um, organizing and, and coalition building, um, because I am stuck on something you said yesterday at Public Kitchen, which is rehearsing. And I'm curious about what we are rehearsing for and the ways that, um, because like when I hear you talk about childcare inside of, inside of, inside of, and so it's a community center. And I was like, you had me until, why do we have to call it a community center? Why can't that be the definition of theater? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so there's something that you said yesterday in rehearsing, what you're talking about here, that connects back to what you said earlier, Summer, um, when you said, I wrote it down, it was like something like you have to experience it to know like we have to get we have to get people in the seats because you have to experience it to know. And I found myself thinking, right, Beto, most folks aren't doing that. Like yeah. they're if if they go to their local theater writ large, at certainly uh, those who are legacy at scale, et cetera, et cetera. You know who I'm talking about, right? That's not what they're going to experience. They're going to experience come in, sit down, shut up, turn off your phone. Yeah. You know, like don't leave until I tell you to. Pay your money. Um, and they and and the code word is like public is free and we Karthik we know that price point is not a thing right like there there's so much here that I feel like in the in the confines of the choir room we take for granted but outside of the choir room the majority of the sort of stall, stalwart legacy arts institutions are nowhere near that kind of experience that you're talking about. And so I'm, I am curious about how we not just dream, but actively rehearse. I think that's what y'all are doing here. Um, that's it, but I, it, get, yeah, one second. I'm gonna, so I'm just gonna say in a, uh, we're gonna, Summer, you wanna say something? And, and Kenny, you wanna say something? And then we're gonna open it up in a minute. So um, just to know what our schedule looks like. Did you wanna? Um, so just very quickly, very briefly, as briefly as I can, thank you, yes, and it, what we are talking about to me, like at its core, is really just our opportunity to reimagine the way we define neighborhood and, and put all of those things within the container of neighborhood because essentially what makes someone a neighbor or something a neighborhood is your physical proximity but also your relational proximity. And how do we build that collectively from Jump Street is so important to what the thing could be. So the thing could actually be anything but it's foundational that we like know who are we actually sharing physical space with and then who am I relating to what does that person bring to the table what do I bring to the table how can we call those resources together how can we make something new from that thing and that could be a new theater or it could be a new hospital system or it could be a new path to cool it could be all of those things but we have to do it first by making the active, active choice to say we are in community with each other and we are going to build neighborhood in a way that does not silo, in a way is not really meant to separate, in a way that is not meant to define us by affinity because we love that here and we have to really get intentional about what it means to do that well. And no one has thought about that that I can tell, which is why uh, the idea of a public lab around growing something with roots that are formed from these very, um, dare I say, pure-hearted ideas that are about humanity feels like the best next path for anything I think in a theatrical landscape because what is storytelling if not figuring out different and better ways to make sure humanity is okay. I was just gonna say we also, in terms of dreaming and imagining, have to imagine new encounters with power mm -hmm. um, because the current arrangements of encounter um, structure it such that we always feel the feelings you described and, I, and maybe the encounter looks like a sweat lodge. Maybe the encounter looks like a picnic table. Like we just have to figure out other encounters and we have to figure out how to get people that we elect to encounter us in other ways so that, that 
dialogue as possible, which I think is, I'm gonna, that's it. I mean, I, I really made my, my sentence. I saw your face. I was like, I'm going to pass it to you. Um, this is Kara again from City of Boston. Um, I think that what's coming to mind for me right now is just that all of these narratives and spaces are so contested. And so I just want to kind of call up from the panel conversation the idea of how important it is to have a lab or a narrative or some sort of um, space that's well resourced for like real collaboration because to the point of like major institutions or even even new things happening in public space like in the coming years we've got it was referenced a couple times by other um, folks but the um, unmonument uh, program which is a comes from the mayor's office of arts and culture funded by the Mellon foundation examining monuments and memorials and it's funding in a, in a way that i'm excited about things that aren't just like object-based public art but performance and all sorts of other things um, but that's happening at the same time as like the 250th, yeah. right? And um, uh, the city's first um, public art triennial is gonna be happening uh, by Boston Public Art Triennial. And so there's gonna be a lot of things kind of, and like an election, whatever, happening. So, so there's like a lot kind of coming into space and all of those things have entirely different foundational assumptions about like what is good for society, what Boston should look like, what the purpose of any of those interventions are. And so I think to the extent that there's alignment, um, finding a way to be in that community together and, and speak with one voice, even if that's through iteration and prototyping and experimentation is super important. Thank you. Um, we're gonna open this out to the outer circle. Hi, friends. Um, and what this looks like is we've got um, our amazing HowlRound staff who have mics. And uh, if somebody in the outer circle would like to throw an idea or, or expand upon something or ask a question, um, be part of the conversation, all you have to do is raise your hand and they will come find you. Um, the prompts remain the same. Uh, what, what bright spots do you see and what are you dreaming? And if there's any piece of, of something that has come up already today that you want to um, spin out into some other part of the conversation, that invitation is there. Um, you can respond or ask further questions. Um, it's all fair game, and I'll do my best to um, be thoughtful about where the hands are. And I'm going to start with you, Ronnie, because you're behind me, and I want to make sure I see you. And I'll be I'll be brief. Oh, um, and also I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you just say who you when you speak, say who you are and give a visual description as well? Great. Uh, Ronnie Pinoy, she hers, Laguna Pueblo in Cherokee, with Arts Emerson, um, shoulder length, brown hair, a sea of freckles, a uh, kind of splashy black on cream shirt, black pants, and uh, um, hopefully cute sneakers for comfort, um, and uh, want to do some plus oneing and some layering on of an additional lens. Lens first one first plus one on the public lab. Yes, yes, yes. I feel like it's uh, so critical, and for us to be able to come together as a community to uh, be radical and vulnerable about sharing how it's going is really important. Um, I'll uplift that there's a in the vein of experiments, work that Arts Emerson is doing with the Huntington to share really vulnerably like what we have been doing with community and is it still working and how do we share that um, and you know, bar supporting that work. So that's, uh, that's exciting and I think that there's, I'm really hoping that there's gonna be more breaking down and sharing. But I, I also wanna bridge something, Kenneth, that you and Stephanie were saying about rehearsing public good. And I think for me, especially as a, someone new, I've only been here um, in Boston three years, so I, I basically just got here. Um, is that to me, so much of the work we're talking about can't happen without a shifting of the sense of the city's identity as it relates to the United States, as it relates to our past. I love to say, inspired by my dear colleague, Keita Sullivan, who likes to say that this is pilgrim land, I will add that Boston is still, at its core, a city that loves cosplay and muskets. You know, and uh, a city that loves cosplay and muskets. So the... <laughs> Love of, um, <laughs> thanks, thanks. So where I have a huge passion point is the notion that the, the history of Boston, before it was the United States, before it was, way before, was black and indigenous. 
and Afro-Indigenous. The, the roots of where we're sitting today is Afro-Indigenous. And Black and Indigenous kinship is hard won, it's important, it's critical, and so I think if we're really talking about public good, in order to get that, we gotta get into some of that really messy, beautiful relational work of how do we start building pathways across difference in these bilateral spaces that are so critical to a given city's identity. So I am uh, super passionate about how understanding Boston differently as a city that isn't black, you know, I look at the Freedom Trail and I see the Black Heritage Trail and I go, why isn't the Black Heritage Trail the Freedom Trail? You know, why is this extra? You know, uh, so how are we restoring American history to be have a, a national and a city identity that is one that is inclusive of the full truth? And until we have, I'm not saying that's going to, we have to wait until that happens to en engage in this conversation um, at all. But I do think it's a parallel lens that can't be lost if we want this to not be built on a foundation that is um, soft and not not stable. Thank you, Thank Ronnie. You. Um, I saw Riley over here. Uh, hello, Riley Greenstein, they, them. I'm the marketing and communications manager at Company One Theater. I have uh, fair skin with lots of freckles and I'd say a little shorter than shoulder length, dark curly hair. I'm wearing this kind of bandana looking button up shirt and some black jeans. Uh, listening to everyone who's already talked so far, I have just been thinking a lot about the idea of Boston not having soul specifically. I, yes, that is so true, but I think the people in Boston do have a lot of soul, but the city itself does not. I'm thinking a lot about just people who are doing a lot of work with arts and community building, not as part of any like organization, just themselves, like uh, basement venues like Taurus Trapped and Pasta Planet or the Arts Collective What If or the people who organize Dyke Descent at Model Cafe every month. They're doing a lot of this like community building and it's really internal and not institutionalized. And because of that, I think there's a way where it's like not as respected. And I mean, it has to somewhat be that way because a lot of time these are happening in like people's houses and you can't just be like mass advertising that, like, hey, come to my home. Uh, <laughs> but my kind of dream for Boston is that energy of people creating events and opportunities for arts and community to shine in the city uh, out of the goodness of their hearts, out of this is what needs to happen, this is just there needs to be a space for this stuff and it doesn't always need to be a space that is like super establishment. But I'm my dream is that this kind of punk grassroots work can I guess be elevated in some way with uh, in with funding and uh, the way that some maybe more larger, more institutional spaces in the city can kind of operate on that. We're doing this not because it's our, not just because it's our job, but because without it, what else are we doing? Thanks, Riley. I see, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just handed a mic, so Fantastic. I'll go. Fantastic, um, then it's your turn. Yeah, great, I'm a Nate Chu. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for Arts Boston, and as part of that, I help run a NAC Boston, the Network of Arts Administrators of Color. Um, there's this like, I, I'm not endorsing this as a mindset, but I feel like for a lot of theaters and arts organizations, community engagement can kind of be seen as a loss leader. It, it's something you do when you have the money to do free programming to encourage people to eventually buy tickets. And it's something that's often kind of siloed off into its own department or they bring in consultants to specifically do it. And by the way, I'm not throwing shade at Arts Boston if my <laughs> boss is watching this. <laughs> different thing but um yeah it's what it does is it kind of creates this departmental segregation where the other parts of an organization aren't necessarily applying those same values of community engagement and it's specific individuals who are championing the program when organizations have that specific funding uh, I guess what I wonder for everyone here is is how we can kind of shift that mindset how we can make community engagement more central to the mission of an entire organization and also how to sell it as something that 
is essential. It's part of audience development and bringing people in and isn't this kind of extra thing. Thank you. Hi, Carol Assertion, they, them, theirs pronouns. I am with Crowded Fire in San Francisco. Uh, I wear glasses, um, short hair with a ponytail and a kind of a messy bun. Um, I, I'm loving all of this conversation and I'm, I'm so just captivated and, and really sitting with this idea of the value of the commons and the public spaces. And at the same time, I think I'm, I'm really grappling with the question of you know public good, public art, bringing public health into the conversation, right? Recognizing that we are doing so much important work that is bringing people together, and at the same time, there's an ongoing pandemic, right? We're, this is not over, we're still grappling with COVID. Um, I think I'm you know, bringing in like the Bay Area is in, a, we've been in a surge for months now, and recognizing how are we making space that is accessible at all levels, you know, accessible economically, but also accessible in terms of geography, also accessible in terms of public health, um, that they're, you know, not necessarily events that can happen in person that everybody is able to, to have competing access needs for. And so I maybe toss that out as a provocation, recognizing that, okay, when, we have all of these different competing, conflicting needs. How are we making sure that we're moving with integrity and moving with values that are supporting um, the work that we're doing and doing so in a way that is uh, continuing to support public safety and public health? Thank you. I was also just handed the mic, so. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I'm taking my turn. Um, my name is Marisa Molinar, or Marissa. Uh, I am a Latinx woman. Uh, I am tan-skinned, uh, with long black hair and a ponytail, wearing a gray turtleneck and pinstripe black pants and fresh white kicks. Um, I am the director of Midday Movement Series, which is a grassroots initiative cultivating a new generation of dance leaders. And I'm also really captivated by all of the comments that have come up already and just want to take a moment to kind of synthesize some of the things that I've been hearing. Um, I was also really taken by Kat's comments about wanting to uh, have more soul in the city. And I'm struck by just noticing the colleagues of mine who are not present in this conversation, who I feel have been the real uh, hearth keepers of the soul of Boston. So specifically, uh, I'm thinking of the fact that I originally am from Texas. I've been here for about 20 years, but I'm always mindful of the fact that I'm not from from here. Whereas uh, certain colleagues of mine, such as uh, I'm thinking of uh, Stacks, Ashton Lights from Stiggity Stacks Worldwide. I'm thinking of uh, May Lisa Chandler and Joe Gonzalez from Joe May Dance, et cetera. So uh, black and brown dance leaders who are from from Boston, uh, who have been just really thriving and insisting on creating moments of thriving within their own communities despite uh, the infrastructural uh, oppression. So um, I would love to see more inclusion of especially leaders who have uh, similarly been creating and thriving and creating moments of cultural sustainability for their communities uh, sort of in spite of uh, the systems that have been and continue to be. Uh, the other thing is that I, in other conversations, especially in the dance community, we have keep on bumping up against this realization that so often institutions don't think of themselves as part of the community, so similar to your comment, you know, the, the community outreach initiatives are created when either we realize there's a problem or as seen as a means to a different kind of end, whereas in uh, organizations and institutions that are developed from community, we don't really need community anything because we, we are the community. So um, maybe that is some of the mind shift that can happen, is that like, uh, just noticing that if we have a specific department, maybe that's an indication that the, the internal work has really not happened yet. Um, and then I think the last thing I will say is that, uh, no, actually I think that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. 
Can we I got, put on yeah. a participant hat for yes, a second? Yes, absolutely. Jamie, please. Hi. Um, uh, Jamie Galoon, she, her, hers with HowlRound, uh, white woman, short brown hair, glasses. Um, I want to uplift a couple other Massachusetts bright spots from where I sit. Um, Spontaneous Celebrations, which is a community-run art center based in JP. They do fantastic work. And I, all, all of these examples, I would say, I don't think they would call themselves necessarily places that are doing public art as public good, but they are, right? Like language can also divide us in a kind of way. And so trying, in the spirit of trying to make visible connections that I've experienced, um, they do incredible work um, in community of, they are of the community. Um, and it's all ages work, it's bringing families out and it's embodied, right? It's people co-creating together um, in the kind of spirit of uh, the better futures that we want today. Um, I also want to uplift the work of Double Edge Theater in Western Mass and in particular what they're doing with the Okoto Cultural Center. Um, and the ways in which they're thinking about their work artistically, but also very much through the lens of the commons, through thinking about solidarity economy, through thinking about resource in ways that are beyond financial. Um, and nationally, I want to uplift the work of powerhouse productions in Bangladown, Bangladown, Detroit, and in particular, their work in Ride at, Ride at, Sculpt, Ride at Skate Park. Um, and Playhouse, which the Hinterlands Theater Ensemble is in residence at, um, and it functions as a kind of, yeah, community space. There's choir practices that happen there. There are, um, you know, neighborhood, uh, like, movie screenings that happen there, and it's a whole constellation of houses that Powerhouse has basically, um, yeah, repurposed, purposed back to community with community. Um, to me, the thread that brings these things together in a lot of ways is this notion of co-ownership, of participating. So it's not people coming to a thing, it's people making the thing, being of the thing, defining the thing, um, and trying to, uh, in some ways, what we've heard today, to me, is around this notion of, yeah, embodied practice. Like, how are we actually... Uh, to Stephanie's point, rehearsing the thing, but like doing the thing and then doing the thing, learning the thing, iterating the thing, figuring out what the thing is together and acknowledging that the thing is divergent <laughs> and multivocal and is not, you know, one. Thanks, Jamie. Also, happy birthday. Thanks. <laughs> just had to slip that in there. Um, and this, by the way, I just want to remind the inner circle, you are also welcome to continue being in conversation um, as the outer circle takes up the challenge. Yeah, Karthik. Um, <clears throat> Karthik Subramanian, 30-something-year-old, um, uh, uh, brown South Indian uh, man uh, wearing a pink kurta um, with white pajamas. Um, this is absolutely going to be in draft, as and if you worked with me now, because uh, I process by speaking. Um, the uh, I think uh, something I'm kind of sitting with is um, the tension around public art in the context of reach versus impact. Um, and uh, kind of intimacy versus uh, the spaces we exist in. I know we talked about it at C1 in the context of uh, art making uh, all the time, um, but uh, something in this conversation, uh, having been uh, on the NIFA panel, uh, which is the New England Foundation for the Arts, uh, and actually reading Duranzi's uh, application around the lot next door was like the trigger for this in some ways around uh, in like the relation to our work too. Um, about the intimacy of what you were proposing and that literally buying in the lot next door uh, against us being sometimes in um, spaces like the library um, and the Strand, which are anywhere between 300 to 1400, like, um, like does that impact land in that public access context? Uh, what is the size of it? Uh, but also the tension uh, against, when it bumps up against revenue, um, where at a certain point when you're operating in a scale like that, um, the sustainability and the resources you need to put in um, puts attention on um, 
how to make that model sustainable um, in a way that does, do we need to like broaden our reach and actually move away from the hyper-local to get to a broader audience? And does that take away from impact? Um, does that hold it? Um, not to say I have answers to any of them, but uh, just questions I put out in the space, I think, because that's definitely something I'm actively thinking about over this weekend and today. Thanks, Karthik. Yeah, Jess. Thank you. Um, so a few things are coming up. Um, thank you, Karthik. Thank you for your comments. Just like the role of the public in public art. And, um, you know, are we inviting people to participate as spectators, as actors? Are we making the art for, well, yes. Is the public making the art? And so, um, to your comments, I appreciate you, you know, lifting up stacks and also your questions around community engagement and um, thinking about and also what are we rehearsing for. Um, and uh, yeah, I wrote down, yes, yeah, like community engaged in art making and that process being the rehearsal for our base building, for our relationships that are going to impact our public life in some way. And so when we ask about dreams, I see this as, or when I think about, you know, the public good, I'm thinking about the most vulnerable people in our city. When I think about the public, that is where my heart and my mind goes to. And um, and so it's like how are, in the, in the work, and one of the bright spots is that, you know, I think that there is opportunity here to engage people and tell stories that have not been told before, um, that are lifting up experiences that um, are, you know, bearing, you know, real social political realities that are um, hard, that are difficult, and that need to change. And so I can't think about public good or public art for public good without thinking about change. Um, and so, and so, I guess, um, you know, Jamie, you like touched on like both of their comments really well um, and also centering the public in art making. And, you know, I kind of go back to that other like P, which is policy, um, where I see, you know, the challenge is, you know, after we gather, you know, the people and we say, hey, let's, you know, imagine together, or let's cast this shared vision together, um, where does that go? And thinking about, you know, there's, you can't have a public conversation without talking about the intersectionality um, of these things and how you need cross-sector collaboration. Um, me working on a lot, you know, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture is like, yeah, let's go. And the Mayor's Office of Housing is like, well, we don't know what we're gonna do with that space. <laughs> and so, um, you know, this is just one point in highlighting, um, you know, how, these cross-sector collaborations can bring resources and sustainability because artists and art institutions can't do it alone. And that also, you know, like what is and how do we hold people accountable or use, you know, stories to hold other stories accountable or even ourselves accountable about, you know, what we tell ourselves or how good the work we're doing is. Um, yeah, as we see it play out in real life and thinking about the impact it has on people's real lives, real opportunities, real outcomes. Thank you so much. I see we've got a mic over here. Hi, Rose Gibson, she, her, hers. I am a biracial Asian and wife, white femme who hates public speaking. <laughs> I am wearing a black and white subcultural themed outfit and I am the leader of operations and management at Crowded Fire Theater in San Francisco. Um, at dinner last night, I spoke about our response, what is our responsibility with placing ourselves in public spaces rather than just focusing on selling tickets and having people come to us. And as a San Francisco re resident, I am very, very both involved with the San Francisco Ballet as a member of their auxiliary, and I live within walking distance of Golden Gate Park, which was designed by the same um, city planner who designed Central Park, so they are very similar in facilities and structure. 
In Golden Gate Park, there are outdoor amphitheaters, stages, courtyards, and pavilions where every weekend there is a rotating assortment of free community events that are based around the arts. The San Francisco Ballet, the Opera, the Symphony, the Gay Men's Chorus all do public free activations within different public spaces, not just Golden Gate Park, but all throughout the Bay Area with a specific goal of bringing in new community, new supporters, and allowing access to those who do not normally have access to such art spaces. Also, the Gay Men's Chorus will do performances. There's even something called Lindy in the Park, where on Sundays there's free swing dancing lessons, and people come from all over the Bay Area to just dance and have an ecstatic community experience. Now, the vector of, from which I speak today is centering around the word infiltration. Now, stay with me. Crowd of Fire Theater is a queer organization. And part of queerness is including the youth and including the elderly. Um, through these outdoor activations, we provide accessibilities for families with small children, families who are low income, families who maybe do not have cars. So when appropriate, they are allowed to access these arts and cultural events without having to worry about transportation or cost or maybe even being in a confined space that may not work for whatever scenario that they're in. Um, also to elderly people who may have to be public transportation reliant or may not be able to have the accessibility needs to be in these public art or in these private art spaces. So you have to bring it to them when they can't come to you. Another vector of this is I encourage you, I want to speak encouragement into you to infiltrate the bourgeois and high society. <laughs> I, um, to go to black tie galas, to go to fundraisers, to go to city hall symposiums and show up, your presence is a protest and your presence also holds these people accountable. And a lot of people say, Rose, why do you hang out with all these terrible people? And it's... <laughs> And it's not that these, aren't, these people are not my community. I'm not doing this because I want to get invited to the, boat house, to the boat house in the Hamptons. It's because I'm blessed to have a very magnetic aura, which a lot of people in this room do. Most of you people do. Even if you don't know that you do, y'all are so special. And you are doing important work that is also very cool work. So you will influence via your own immersion. You have to create influence via personal collect, uh, connections and relationships, which really help when you're trying to influence or infiltrate public spaces. Um, you need the help of politicians. You need the help of councilmen. You need the help of people who are on the board of this and that, or on the council of this and that, who can validate your presence. Um, it forms trust. It creates curiosity in the cause that you stand for. And it garners support for what you're doing because they see you as part of the exterior circle. You're also holding space for other minorities and creators of different cultures because when you infiltrate the space and they get used to your presence, it creates space for others. So I encourage you all to infiltrate from the inside out, to take up the space. Your presence is a protest. It also holds these people accountable because they know you're there, you're watching, you're listening, and you have a long memory. <laughs> so go to the social clubs, go to the galas, go to the fundraisers. If you have the financial resources or the social networks to be able to decolonize high society. Mm. Thank you. And I think uh, Marissa wanted to expand on her other statements, so I'm just... Sure. And I just want to make sure, do we, are we good? Yeah, great. Go ahead. Just really quickly, thank you, Rose. Um, and my comment actually uh, segues really readily from yours. Just one bright spot I wanted to uplift is that I consider so many people in this room uh, to be part of that infiltration process. Uh, so I just wanted to voice my appreciation for you all uh, for doing the work that you do and helping to change the institutional culture uh, by your insistence on remaining a part of your communities. Thank you. Um, we have about 10 minutes, uh, and so what I want to do is give a couple more opportunities to anyone in the outer circle who wants to speak. We've got one, two, three. Great. And then we'll start to do a little wrap-up, um, unless somebody absolutely has a burning need to speak after those three, which is also fine. Who's first? 
I can, I can start. Great. Um, Riley Allison, um, I am the leader of production and community at Crowded Fire in San Francisco. Um, I'm a light-skinned, uh, non-binary human who uses they or fey pronouns, uh, wearing a dark green uh, dress and shoes that don't match. Um, <laughs> I, uh, in thinking about, you know, community, in thinking about resources, I was really drawn to the broken business model concept and the need for profitability and really just wanted to uplift that, like, we live in this capitalistic society, but, and, and have to live within this capitalistic society, but art and shouldn't always be steeped in that capitalism um, and that you can't commodify culture. Um, and so really feeling like a reframing of art and theater, not as a business, but as a service. Um, and um, before my time at Crowded Fire, I lived very near um, Teatro Campesino and its history of protest. And so thinking about the lot next door and related to like protest and art and theater making and storytelling and how all of that is so important. Um, and so my, my dream is not resources for profitability, but resources for sustainability and longevity. And so thinking about how can we have the money to do the thing for years to come without having to think about like how much money it's making other than to keep doing what we're doing. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Raymond. I use he and they. I'm the executive artistic director at Cleveland Public Theater. I'm a Middle Eastern North African with a braid and a goatee and a purplish shirt. Uh, yeah, there's so much here. Thank you for this incredible conversation and for everything we've been learning here. Also, thank you because I, I don't know, I, I started feeling really grateful to be in Cleveland today. <laughs> and uh, some of the networks that are there that just seem not present here. Um, one of the things I, I'm thinking a lot about is we haven't talked enough about children. You know, in a lot of um, cultural forms, excellence is defined by if you have a child on stage, um, you know, certain um, singing forms, particularly in the Middle East, even you, you, you stick it, you know, a family member is gonna just be sitting on stage crawling around the stage while the music's being played because you want them to already start being used to being up there. And this is also true in a lot of African dance traditions. And I've just been thinking about how as a society we've really um, sort of siloed off children into schools and into all these things. And as artists, we have been increasingly told that if we are educators, we're not as good artists. I mean, I've been told like five times to take everything educational off of my resume because it makes me look unprofessional. Um, so this idea uh, that um, if we're talking about public good, it has to include children. And also just for Cleveland Public Theater, how that has actually been the entry into families and into, into communities that maybe we would have no other entry in. We run programs at three different public housing sites week after week, you know, relentless engagement. And that has created not only engagement with all these families, but, but when I'm programming or when I'm creating as an artist, they're in my head, they're in there, they're part of me as an artist, I'm changed. I, I think the other thing is um, just the graying, I think this is already being said, but I just wanna like maybe articulate it, the graying of amateur to professional and the role that someone who has dedicated their lives to a craft play and the role that someone who has never done that art plays as well and that this, this is a really important in the public spectrum that this this huge range um, can exist and again I think to legitimize ourselves as a field we deliberately were saying we're, we, we're not amateurs right to legitimize ourselves but actually in doing so we broke uh, our relationship to the public um, and uh, and then just my final thought uh, is uh, about social about social service and before we were talking about loneliness, I think David brought it up, the sense of loneliness as a crisis. But there's so many um, in deeply problematic 
whether they're health or societal things that, that, that art can really make a big impact around, whether that's around addiction, infant mortality, abuse, all of these things. And I just feel like there's all of these opportunities for us to be for the public good in a really pronounced way that is not just about public change or social policy change, but literally about changing someone and families. Thank you. And then I think Leslie, you have. Yeah, go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Were you going to go first? You first. And then okay, I'll go to thank Mike. you. Uh, thank you just for my thought. I wasn't going to speak, but now I feel I need to. Um, and I echo everything. It, so much gratitude for all of this conversation and all the work everyone's contributing. Um, Marguerite and Carol know on the way here, we were walking and I had just gotten an email. And s Summer, it's never left me what you said about the experience and what that means. And what you just mentioned about getting to some really deep, deep work in our communities that, where the healing, need, what I call healing justice needs to occur. I just learned today that a young woman, an Alaska native, found her way to our play called Cold Case that addresses the impact of missing and murdered indigenous women issues on a family. She's uh, distantly related to one of our cast members who just learned. She made her way to our play. She's been missing. She's been on the run because she's stalked. And she just made the decision to reach out to this cast member, her family member, so she can go home and heal. And I'm so pleased that we have been deep in community to lend our platform to the MMIW movement. Last week, legislation was signed into law. We've been lending our skills, and I don't take, this is humble people, we just are stage managers for the MMIW marches. We lend our skills. We don't have to be the ones out front. We lend our security and community organizing uh, skills and certifications, all of those kinds of things we've been building for years to make sure these things can happen, to lend to, someone mentioned movement building, to lend to movement building. And then I had met and had the honor and uh, the invitation to attend a stalking prevention awareness training two years ago when we were developing this play, and I just knew in my heart we had to offer this training to the community. And we have been. And I think word is getting out about how to encourage people to get healing, to document, to document, and to support each other, to have a healthy ecology, to have a healthy community. So I just want to thank you for naming experience, not only for those who've never experienced maybe some kind of level of performing arts or uh, an art in a cultural um, space, Kenny, like yours, but those who need to come home to heal. And so just thank you, everybody, for all your work. It's, it's working. Yeah. And, not just the perseverance, it's, it's being in this entire ecology of all the work you're all doing. It's working. So my deepest gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. I'm going to ask Mika to have our final comment, and then I'm going to wrap us up. OK, sure. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Mika. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm an artist and cultural organizer here. And I wanted to, to sort of share this like through line I'm feeling and hearing of what it means to be preparing for the end of empire. What it means to practice for uh, going back to people and going back to like being in a circle together instead of all of these fancy words that we have, that separate and structures that, that divide us. Um, I'm part of a space called the Cultural Equity Incubator. And so many people in this room have actually poured into it to be possible. And what we're doing is we're stewarding both the physical space and, uh, a, and a hub, a, a, a ethereal realm of collective action. And so we are Midday Movement Series. We are Arts Connect International. Uh, we are Abilities Dance Boston, Danza Organica. We have multiple core partners, Mass Creative, right here, who are 
holding down different niches of the fight because we need to be on many mediums and we need to be meeting people in all sorts of interventions um, and infiltrations. Um, and so by sharing this and by applying for funds together, we're able to share resources and map our resources in a different way so that people who are preparing for the second annual Trans Resistance March uh, and Festival in Franklin Park have a place to practice so that a solidarity network from the Philippines called Leong Network that I'm a member of um, that is red tagged, that is being targeted uh, at home for terrorism on the basis of our community work with indigenous peoples has a, a local hub at right at the root cause of actually a lot of what we're facing in the colonies still. Um, so to create those pipelines and to create the relationality between people, Manilenios, who have been in a colonized city in Manila, Philippines, the same amount of time as Wampanoag people in Boston, Massachusetts, have been experiencing the building of a city upon their waters. This is water, Shamut, a place where waters meet. Um, this, this land can even be returned and be reclaimed by the earth that wants it. And I'm so excited by the way that we are trying to, to network uh, and, and network, like re-people, re re, uh, reconnect. Um, and, and thus we can like really rematriate on a larger scale and fix this like, like core pain which we experience the effects of like this nonprofit industrial complex all of that is privatizing funds of millionaires into tax shelter foundations to then dole out to how they think a, a social illness can be fixed no though that's our money that's our money that should be democratized and spent by all the people for all people to have a say into our future testify thank you I'm so, so grateful to each and every one of you for um, your vulnerabilities, your reflections, your questions and provocations. I think um, there's so much more to uh, discover and link in the conversations that have happened today and I know from the full weekend uh, of the convening moving forward. Um, I'm gonna name a couple of threads, I can't possibly summarize the whole thing, but I'm gonna name a couple of threads that feel important and then we're going to adjourn to have a nice reception uh, and where we can continue these conversations one on one. Um, I wanna reflect the power of locality uh, and hyper-locality that when we work side by side with neighbors, that that strengthens the more expansive impacts that we can have that go beyond the hyperlocal. I wanna reflect that I'm hearing a lot about partnerships and platforming of issues and, and collaborations that move at the speed of trust rather than the speed of urgency, and resisting the urgency because we know that if we can get in there for the long haul, that the payoffs are huge. Um, I heard someone say the other day, like, you know, you're, if you're thinking about starting something and you're like, oh man, it's going to take like three years to get there. Well, those three years are going to pass anyway. But what if when the three years passed, you'd actually gotten there? You'd achieved the thing that you were planning. Um, so don't, be put, don't pe be put off by the commitment and length of the relationship building that these works take. I'm hearing about the power of serendipity and uh, what it means to have public ownership, that when programs and public art happens in communities and happens on the ground and happens in permeable spaces, that people who are merely walking by can have an ownership over that work and have a buy-in and feel belonging, um, even if that wasn't on their like, to-do list for that day, right? I'm hearing about um, the power of mentorship up and down a spectrum of experience, as well as the power of um, inclusion of children to elders um, across, and, uh, and folks who have all kinds of access um, needs and what those may be. We, it is our job to ideate and create unexpected paths of access. I'm hearing that. Um, I'm hearing about infiltration as a powerful tool um, uh, in all kinds of ways. And that creativity requires not knowing. 
We cannot know the answer before we begin. And that the place of experimentation and flexibility is a power and a resource that we share as long as we can build the systems around ourselves to trust and hold that experimentation without pressing urgently for the need of results. I'm sure there was so much more, but that's what hit me. Um, and I'm really grateful to everybody for being here as part of it and to our live stream audience. Thank you, guys. Um, we can adjourn to the lobby for a beautiful reception. And um, Jamie, is there anything else I'm supposed to say? Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.